You're listening to the best of the bravest. Interviews with the FDNY's elite. Not to sound like a broken record, but we did start this mini series, as I've noted before, last year. And it was a random thought because I was interviewing so many cops and I said to myself, why am I not speaking to firemen? And then came Ray Seely, Fat Daddy, uh, a yeah. mutual friend of myself and my next guest who I'll introduce momentarily. That was volume one. And now here we are tonight for episode 212, volume 27, which is crazy of the best of the bravest interviews with the FDNY's elite. If you haven't checked out the previous episode, that was volume 26. It's the second fire marshal I've ever interviewed. And that was Lou Garcia, who at one point was the chief fire marshal for the FDNY. Before that, he was in Rescue One for a little while, started out in Brooklyn, actually got laid off for a while during the city turmoil of in terms of finances during the mid 1970s really good guy that was a great show to talk to a great guy to talk to for that particular show i should say and uh i'm sure my next guest will be great tonight and some people don't know what they want to do with their lives others figure it out as they get older everybody's different of course some know right from the beginning and with tonight's guest you could say that's certainly the case with him he's a lifelong new yorker born with a burning desire to fight fire and he dedicated over a quarter century of his life to that very cause he's still active as we'll talk about tonight in a different respect he was a volunteer firefighter for a while and of course he got to live the dream as a new york city fireman for 17 years 1988 up until 2004, 2005, around there, as we'll discuss tonight. And that, for this volume 27 of the Best of Bravest interviews with the Empty Wise Elite, is Ron Caraba. Ron, welcome. How are you? Hey, Mike. How's things going, man? I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you tonight. Well, I appreciate you making the time for me. For those of you who are here from Getting Salty, of course, you know him as Ron Zoni. He's in the chat regularly, so Ron Zoni's here tonight. And I've been meaning to do the show with him for a while, so nice to finally have it. Tell me about growing up. You grew up on the island, right? Uh, I was born in Brooklyn. Uh, moved out in second grade, you know, uh, spent uh, probably, of course, the mo most of my life on Long Island in Suffolk County. Uh, we moved from uh, Borough Park, Brooklyn, to uh, a town called Islip Terrace, which is uh, south shore of Long Island, about halfway out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went, uh, started, in, I was in second grade when I moved out there. Mm -hmm. So that's where, uh, that's where I ended up. And, um, that's uh, how I became a fireman. Actually, the guy that lived right across the street from me was a New York City fireman and a bagpiper by the name of Tom McEnroe Sr., my mentor. And uh, unfortunately, he just passed away a little while ago. But uh, as a young a guy and a volunteer, to have a guy like him by your side, it was really, uh, he was my own personal fire guru. And it was uh, a wonderful experience. Of course, and these were really, and this is no disrespect to the current crop who are great in their own right, but these were such salt of the earth firemen and just salt of the earth people that it's easy if you wanted to go into civil service to gravitate towards guys like that because look how much fun they were having. Oh, yeah, it was unbelievable. And um, he just missed being a charter member of the band by about six months. His very good friend Jim Ginty was a charter member. And uh, I was, I've been listening to bagpipe music since I'm 10 years old because every summer he would have a party at his house with a couple of the band members and they would tune up the, the bagpipes on the front lawn and then they would march in the backyard and play. And I've been addicted to bagpipe music since I'm 10 years old and uh, I'm an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like it myself and I'm a Hispanic. Usually, you know, growing up, I, I thought of it, it, it's always played in a somber sense, at least in my mind. You always heard it at police funerals, fire department funerals. But no, there's plenty of happy bagpiping that goes on too. And as I've oh, gotten yeah. older, I, I, I really appreciated that. It's very cool. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite the talent. This is Ron Kiraba, and this is Volume 27 of the Best of the Bravest Interviews with the FDNY's Elite. If you do have a question for him, and I know some of you will as you tune in, as the show progresses, you can fire away, and I'll get to it at the proper time if I can. So being in the volleys, you know, you see these guys, so many of them, if they're emergency service cops in the city, they're also on the volleys sometimes. Obviously, if they're firemen in the city, same thing. Wanting to get onto the New York City Fire Department, it took a while. But nevertheless, these guys are bringing their expertise from the city to you. What would you say were some of the pivotal lessons you learned early on? Not even with fire duty, but just emergencies in general. Um, you know, you, you learn in this in the, the fire service, you know, it, it's impossible when you come out of the blocks, you know, and, and it, it, you have a mentor, you have you, you rely heavily on the senior personnel uh, to teach you, you know, and, uh, you know, just being aware of your uh, surroundings and uh, having your head on a swivel and uh, paying attention to, to what's going on when you're moving in, you know, 
as time goes on and the more seasoned you get, you, you get to, you know, you, you rely on your past ep- experiences to help you with, with what's presenting in front of you uh, in your day-to-day operations. Uh, I can't really say for one, you know, I mean, I, I remember my first captain, uh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a Marine and he was a bus driver and he was a hard charger. And w- when he took the reins as the captain of uh, the engine company I was in, uh, we were like a well-oiled machine. I mean, the guy wouldn't even have to bark out an order because we trained so much. I, he would say, all right, you know what to do when we pulled up somewhere and guys would be going in 10 directions, grabbing tools, grabbing what we need. And, and then we stood fast until we got an order. And, uh, you know, the fire service is always like that. You rely on your senior men for guidance and direction. And, uh, of course, your experiences uh, help you to become a better firefighter. Yeah, so of course. It's, 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 over, it's over a time period. You know, you hear guys that talk on both uh, your podcast and on on getting salty. You know, uh, you know, especially when you get promoted, like guys who get promoted, they don't feel comfortable in rank until a certain amount of time, years to you know to make sure that uh, you have that confidence. You know, and the funny thing is with the fire service, when you get in as a younger firefighter, you want to prove your worth. You know, so it's always. Uh, you got to keep an eye on the new guys that come in and girls, you know, because they, they might push themselves or overextend a little bit to, to make a good name for themselves. But meanwhile, not realizing that, you know, they could be getting into a situation that they, they shouldn't be in, you know? So your eagerness to learn and uh, the experience of others, uh, you got to have a a good balance there. And, uh, you know, as time goes on, you, 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 uh, you earn your stripes, so to speak, you know? Yeah, it's an interesting evolution and it goes for any job, but especially the first responder community. And I see my friend Billy Kennedy in the chat who just tuned in. Hey, Billy, emergency service cop, as an example, it got to a point with him where he was a train. He was training other emergency service cops that wanted to get into the unit at their academy. But he had to start somewhere, as he told me when he was on this show. So it's the same thing with the fire department. Before you can teach others, either in an official capacity as an instructor or an unofficial capacity, you learn your stripes, and it's not even in what you hear directly from these guys. It's just by watching them, you know, and you can pick up helpful habits that way. Absolutely. You know, I, uh, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, mm-hmm. A verbal co- conversation about something versus a visual. Visual, you, you, you're, you probably absorb it a lot quicker and a lot, you know, it, it's more detailed when someone's actually showing you how to, you on on the on the the get salty podcast i mentioned i i always had chalk in my pocket as a company officer and whenever i wanted to discuss something i would draw you know we were third do engine or third whatever standing fast i would draw on a roll down gate this is how we cut it you know it make people see it they remember it it's easier yeah. i i think it's easier that way you know oh yeah because you could and it's so true because for example let's take the hearse tool all right, uh, Billy, what do you got to do with the Hearst tool? Uh, point X, point Y, and uh, point Z. Okay, great. Now do it. Uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's a lot different. You can read it in a, in a book. You know, you could write it down a million and one times, but to actually visualize it, different story, you know? And most yeah. people, I think, are visual learners. I'm one of yeah. them. Absolutely. It's, it, you, they're dual learners, but I, in my opinion, I think visually you pick things up quicker by seeing yeah. it. I would say. I would say. So in addition to your volley experience, you had a year in uh, New York City EMS pre-merger, well before the merger in 96, 79, 80. Tell me about riding the back of an ambulance for a year. Let me tell you, it was it was unbelievable. Um, You know, uh, they are the unsung heroes of the city. Uh, You know, they're they're not recognized um, as police officers, firefighters, and uh, they they do a bulk of or what's going on out there. Let, let all major municipalities, pretty much, almost all across this country, uh, incorporate EMS into their, uh, you know, and fire service. So that's a, a large bulk of, of what they do, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, you know, we took it on. Uh, and, uh, you know, our response time was was the catch all for them. And we from the from receipt of alarm to uh, arriving, we're somewhere in the four to five minute range pretty much all the time, you know, extenuating circumstances while responding to traffic and so on and so forth, a breakdown or an accident. But, 
you know, on any given day, when a run comes in, we're out the door under a minute and a half, maybe two minutes the most, and uh, we get there in a rapid time frame. So that's that's a plus for the people that are in need, you know. Right. Uh, but working in EMS was really a lot of fun. Uh, I met some wonderful people. Um, when I got on there, they they changed the academy to more like a boot camp with running and physical fitness and. Uh, it was uh, like a quasi-military. The guys that were running it, obviously, were military guys. And, uh, you know, it was a good experience. Uh, I took it because I was under the impression that I was going to get hired to the fire department. And uh, as we discussed earlier, you know, uh, I was at the bottom of one list. I was at the top of another list. And both lists were in court for 12 years. So my intention was to, you know, get back into the city because I figured within a year I'd be on the FDNY. And uh, uh, I ended up, uh, my list number died. I died on the list and I, I had the, the presence of mind to take the second test just to cover my bases. But uh, EMS wise, it was a wonderful experience. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I, I've been doing it a long time. Like I said, since 1976, the first ambulance I ever rode in was a Cadillac ambulance. <laughs> I mean, they were small. You couldn't stand up in them. And uh, I, I had a call in EMS where this this fellow went. He went flatline in the back of the ambulance. We, there's two people in the bus, a driver and a tech. And I'm in the back filling out the PCR. And I look up and the guy's in cardiac arrest. And uh, I did the most unorthodox CPR that I've ever done in my life between, you know, not a rhythmic five breaths, one compress, you know. I did the most unorthodox CPR, and two days later, I was in the hospital talking to this guy. I sustained his circulation. We sustained, my, my partner and I, and we were able to get him to the hospital where they were able to induce, uh, get drugs on board. A medic wasn't available, and we had a kind of scoop and run. And we got him to, uh, I believe it was Methodist Hospital, and uh, two days later, I was at bedside uh, talking to him with a translator. He was uh, Spanish-speaking, but uh, it was a miracle. You know, because CPR, it's it's very difficult to actually uh, sustain or, or bring somebody back. The odds are against you. Of course. And that's yeah. a helpful reminder because sometimes, you know, when you're in emergency work, when you're, especially in the fire department, which is the basis of it, the police department, not so much. There are units for it, yes, but the fire department is primarily based on emergency rescue work. You have those moments that are tough where you can't bring somebody back. And yes, that's part of the job. But then you have moments like that that I imagine reaffirms your love and why oh. you wanted to do it in the first place. It's it's the greatest feeling in the world, you know. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I had the, also the pleasure of delivering my first child as an EMT with the New York City. Uh, actually, it was Health and Hospitals Corporation. Uh, my partner didn't want to have any part in delivering <laughs> this child. Because he was just, he was on the job for quite a few years before me, and uh, the OBGYN kit that you get it's it's actually the size of a loose leaf paper, and I the, I walk into it and it's a plastic bag, and I'm holding it up, and I'm telling the woman she's in the middle of a contraction and she's screaming, and I'm like, uh, first thing I said to her when we walked in was, uh, what seems to be the problem here, man? And, and she told me this is no time to be making jokes. I'm having a baby. So I held up the OBGYN kit. I said, I have everything in this bag to safely deliver your baby here. She didn't want to have any part of it either. So we packaged her up. And by the time we got her onto the gurney, another contraction came. And uh, fortunately for me, unfortunately for her, we, we had to deliver the baby. And it was uh, a baby boy. And it was uh, to tell a mom it's a boy was a, a pretty cool experience as well. Man. i got to tell you. Yeah. Man. I don't, I don't envy women who have to go through that, man, especially because it's not just that moment. It's all the nine months before that. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. And, and my goodness, I, I tip my hat off uh, to those yeah. women. And me, I was 10 pounds when I was born. So oh. <laughs> my mom had quite the time uh, getting me into the world. So before I get into 1988, you coming on during that summer, you were a chief of department in your second volunteer company. Uh, so it's an interesting role to have. A lot of the guys that you see, you know, in the city, if they're volleys out on the island, they've been chief. Most of them have at some point. So what goes into being a volley chief? Um, a lot of time and effort and energy. And at times it seems like a thankless job. Um, everybody that sees a, a volley chief with the car, they're like, oh, you got the free car. And uh, that is the furthest statement from the truth with the amount of phone calls and 
and drills and, and uh, personnel issues and uh, stuff of that nature. It's, it's a heck of a lot harder than, than people would imagine it to be. And uh, it's a tremendous responsibility, you know, uh, you're, in, you're in charge of the scene and everybody on it. So uh, with that comes a lot of responsibility. And, uh, you know, the beauty is that there was uh, three other assistant chiefs that helped me along. So uh, it was a wonderful experience. It's something I always wanted to do as a young guy. And uh, I'm pretty happy I got the opportunity to do it. Yeah, it was uh, amazing. I'm, I'm smiling because I, I just got roasted here by my buddy, Darren Phillips. He's like, and for those of you, this is for context. I posted a throwback of me as a, as a toddler in 2002. It says 10 pounds. And most of that was your head, right? LOL. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a very big head. As a, as a I saw woman. the picture, Mike. And, uh, <laughs> you grew yeah. into your head. I did. I did uh, quite yes, grow into did. that head of mine. My goodness. Yeah. And, and then, yeah. and, and somebody said, it, and you said something too, but uh, somebody said Zeke Rebelli. I think seeks an E-man, if I'm not mistaken. He's like, so that's how you're able to guard all this information. <laughs> <laughs> so I yeah. felt like I was at the firehouse kitchen table there, and uh, that was but good. So thank no you. No mercy Gary. there. No, no mercy, no mercy there, at all. No. But I feel like I'm one of the guys. It'd be worse if they didn't roast me. Oh, yeah. You know? No doubt. That's, that's, if, that's a, that's a if they're not answer. breaking your chops, they probably don't like it. Yeah. No. And, and uh, you, they you broke can... my chops a lot, bro. So. <laughs> I'm well loved, I guess. <laughs> no, of course. And that gets into it. So it's it's the summer of 88. You're finally able to get on and cut through all that bureaucrat, bureaucratic red tape that's well beyond your control. And you start out in 225. Now, I always ask this because it's your first FDNY company. You're no stranger to the fire service, right? So you had the experience as a volley. And when I asked this of Hank Molay, I'm like, did the guys like the fact that you had prior experience when you first got on? He's like, no. Mm -hmm. So did you even bother saying, hey, I was a volley? Uh it, no, I, I tried to keep my cards close to my chest, but right. uh, things leak out, you know, and uh, it, it's it's amazing, you know. Uh, the the fire the volunteer fire service has this uh, publication. Uh, it's called Fire News, and it's a monthly publication, and it's you know fires and emergencies all across the island, both Nassau and Suffolk, and. Uh, so one day I was assuming the house watch from a senior guy and uh, I, I got in there a little early. I had some reading material. You know, I was taught to, to start reading the books at a young age as a firefighter, you know, just to, to, to better yourself as a fireman. And um, I happened to bring in the fire news with me. And uh, the senior guy that I relieved on the house watch, he crumpled the paper up in front of me. And he told me if I ever bring that non-union rag in this house watch again, he was going to stick it where the sun don't shine. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think he was kidding around. You know, I'm, I'm good friends with the guy to this day. And uh, oddly enough, I happened to teach his son in probie school before I retired. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, he kind of let me know that he's pro-union, which I am as well. But, uh, you know, don't bring this around. And I said, okay. You got was, it. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. It's pretty funny, actually. You know. No, I imagine. So for yeah. those not familiar with the geography of the city, where's 225 located? Okay. Um, we're on the corner of Linden Boulevard and Lincoln Avenue in uh, the geographical 75th precinct of the New York Police Department, which is uh, East New York. Uh -huh. And uh, it is uh, a very active neighborhood. It's uh, high crime, low income. So um, a lot goes on there, you know, and there, there's there's a bunch of hardworking, strong, determined people in that neighborhood, and they're doing their best to, to better their lives every day. And, um, you know, it's just difficult for them as well. But, uh, you know, I got there in uh, August of 1988, and uh, it was at the height of the crack epidemic. And... Uh, you know, you want to talk about the Wild West. I mean, gunshots. I mean, one of the first things they told me when I got to the firehouse was, you know, blah, blah, this, that, the other thing. And, uh, oh, yeah, and if you hear gunshots, step away from the windows. That was one of the first things I was told. And uh, it wasn't uncommon. I mean, gun gunfire, you know, all the time. Day, night, weekends. New Year's Eve, forget about it. You know, it sounded like Iraq. 
everybody had a gun. It was crazy. It was really, really a, a crazy time for the city, you know, with the crack at the full blown epidemic. It was uh, very difficult, you know. I have to say the motto, and uh, Billy, you'll appreciate this because Billy worked in Seven Truck for a little bit in ESU, which is in Brooklyn, of course. It was 71st Precinct's motto, that is. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you a homicide. Yeah. You know, and, I, and, and their geographic area is not that big, and yet they had a lot of crime in that small well, compact vicinity. So I was talking earlier about non-fire emergencies. You're going to overdoses. You're going to attempted homicides and actual homicides. You know, listen, that's kind of where the term ghetto fireman's born from. But the thing is, and I talked about this with Jeff Cool when he was on the show, guys are, and rightfully so, because you mentioned the hardworking, good people in that neighborhood, you guys are so freaking proud of being ghetto firemen. You wouldn't have had it any other way. You know what? If I, if I knew uh, now, if I knew then what I know now, I might have explored other options in the New York City Fire Department, you know, could have, should have, would have. Right. But uh, absolutely no regrets. Um, I got assigned to a really, really great firehouse with a great bunch of guys. No, no, we're not the most slashing companies in the job. And, and we're, you know, a lot of different companies are steeped in a lot of tradition. Uh, but you know what? All the all the guys, all the senior guys on the job sent their sons to 225 engine because Captain Patty Corcoran was at the helm. And uh, all the guys knew that if they were under Captain Patty's tutelage. They were going to get taught the right way. So, um, I, the guys in my firehouse, all you know, staff chiefs, you know, John Farrell, his father was Matthew Farrell, who was asked to be chief of department two or three times, and fire commissioner. He turned them all down. He was the Manhattan Borough Commander. Bobby Carroll's father was a staff chief. Joe Smithwick, his father was a, a, a battalion chief. Uh, his uncle was a battalion or a deputy. And I mean, the, 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 the amount of, uh, you know, father son stuff that, that was on Lincoln Avenue, you know, it was, it was, there was a lot of guys that got put there because their fathers knew the leadership in that firehouse and they wanted their sons to be trained the right way. So I was lucky to get in there, you know, uh, right. my uncle who was a retired Lieutenant from two fifty seven. Uh, helped me along and got me in the door over there. I wanted to go to the 15th division and I got lucky enough to go. And again, you, you go to these areas in the Bronx, the guys in Salty talk about the Bronx band. You go to these areas in Brooklyn, you ask any of the guys from rescue too. And this is no knock to anybody else. The FDNY does great work day in and day out, but some of the best firemen you will find in the city's history have worked in neighborhoods like that. And during that era, was it the warriors? No. And Hassagan touched on this when he was on Salty, not on this show. But still, during that era, even before crack, just the 80s into the early 90s in general, you guys were still right in the thick of some very heavy stuff. You know, it's funny, Mike. When I was a kid, I wanted to be on during the war years. And I got on in the 80s, late 80s, the early late 80s. A good friend of mine, Paul Rhodes, says I got on the job in the early late 80s. I'm a three-decade fireman, the 80s, the 90s, and the 2000s. Uh, but, um, you know, the guys that are getting on now wish they got on when I got on. So it's funny, you know, it, because we were doing more fire duty then than they're doing now. But when I was there, we weren't doing the fire duty that they were doing before us. So, you know, I, I always tell guys when you get on the job, from whatever time you walk in the door to whatever time you leave, that's your fire department and you make the best of those times. You, you can't, you know. You can't go back to being in the war years and you can't, you know, you just have to, that time frame is yours and you make the best of it. And, uh, you know, it's funny, the fires come, you know, the fires always happen. You know, you, you gotta be working. And if you're not working, you'll get a phone call. Hey, you missed another job and they break your shoes. And, but in a well-rounded career, I mean, I only did 17 years, but in that 17 years, I went to plenty of fires and, uh, different types of emergencies and, you know, just, just a host of things. And, uh, you know, if you're on the job long enough, you'll get, you'll get all the experience you need, you know? Right. Now it's an yeah. interesting evolution over time. Think about what the fire service was in New York city alone when you came on in 1988 versus what it was by say 2000 or by the time you retired yeah. in 2005, you know, it had changed a lot and it's still changing. And I guarantee you there'll be guys 20 years from now 
that'll say, ah, I wish I could have been working there in the 2020s. I'm telling you. You know, I, I got on the job and I'm in New York. Back when I first got on the job, we had mutual cards. So if you wanted to go out on get a time off, you had to put it on a mutual card. It had to be signed by the boss. So I'm in there putting a mutual. And there's a senior guy in there, he probably had close to 30 years, and he's complaining about how terrible the job is. This job stinks. I can't wait to retire, blah, 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 blah. It's not like it used to be. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking, you know, I'm in the firehouse and I'm saying to myself, man, I don't know what he's talking about. I think this is the greatest thing that ever happened. You know, right. it's, it's just generational. And over time, you know, uh, I, I'll never forget when the thermal imaging cameras came into play and uh, the senior, the senior guy, like I, I had just gotten promoted when uh, we started getting cameras and there was guys that were dead set against it. They didn't want to have anything to do with this technology. Ah, <laughs> and my, I, I, I would, here's simple. I was blind and now I can see. That's what that camera does for you. Right. But no, you shouldn't walk through the fire with your head in the camera because then if you're three rooms deep and the camera breaks or something happens, now you're in trouble. Right. So you got to use it tactically, you know, raise it up, scan the room, move to a point, raise the camera up again, you know, and that, you know, you, you use it that way instead of relying on it solely, you know, but. Change is always hard, especially in the New York City fire department. They went from leather helmets to the composite helmets. And now I think the leather helmets are making a comeback. But in the beginning, they, they didn't want to, you know, to change. It was like, oh, my God, you know, chop off my arm. Like, you can't do this. You know, like, it's unacceptable. But you know what? It, you got to you got to be flexible and you got to you got to go with the, the, the bends and the, and the curves. And uh, it all it all works out, you know. Even down to the vehicles, and, and I got a great question that segues into that perfectly, changing from the Max to the Pierces or the C grades, you know, and, and things of that nature. Even something like that becomes a point of contention. But as the job evolves and as the city that you're working in, wherever that city may be, evolves, you have to evolve with it. Yeah, no doubt. You know, the, I'll tell you, when I got on the Max, man, they were some fast fire trucks. Those things flew. Yeah, I've heard. And we, we had a bunch of... Uh, seated chauffeurs you know in the house both engine and truck chauffeurs that were they were magicians and they can get them rings down tight blocks and hey, get them anywhere it was really uh it was awesome it was the best best times of my life i don't doubt it i don't yeah. doubt it ron carab is our guest this is volume 27 of the best of the bravest interviews with the ftny elite if you're a fan of getting salty you know him as ron zoni Stu kelsa who you often see in this chat and also the chat for salty he's tuning in from across the pond where it's about 11 30 right now at night over there and he says question for ron over your incredible career of the numerous changes that the ftny has gone through what we were just talking about was there one thing that at the time at least you massively disagreed with um I don't think it was a massive dis disagreement, but um, when we when we went when we when we assumed when we took over EMS, that that was a very tough pill to swallow in the beginning. And um, uh, contractually, we kind of got uh, burned because uh, uh, we took on EMS and uh, we ended up signing a five year contract and the first two years were zeros. And those were the first two years that we were doing EMS. So there was a very big bone of contention across the job uh, with, with the fact that uh, first guys didn't want to do it. And secondly, uh, that in that time where we, we went above and beyond, we got something added to our plate with, without any, uh, you know, we didn't two zeros, you know, uh, that's when you when you're when you're a civil servant, you, you're surely not doing this job for the money. You know, when you get up in rank and you pro progress your career that way, then then the money comes along. And uh, but uh, as, as a firefighter, um, you know, it was very tough when I got I, I was married with one kid when I got on the job. I was making twenty eight thousand dollars a year. And I, before that, I was self-employed for five years, doing very well. And. Um, the business didn't do so well in the end and the letter came for the fire department, but being, being a married guy with, with one kid and having to, to, to find other ways to get money in, into the household, you know, it, it's difficult. So, uh, getting those two zeros and, you know, working all the work that, that the job did without getting anything for it was kind of, uh, a smack in the face and it was a tough pill to swallow, but 
we're well past that now. And, uh, you know, nothing really stands out. Um, I was just so happy to be hired and be on the job, uh, you know, right. whatever. <laughs> I was just, uh, it was, it was literally my lifelong dream. And, you know, I've seen many guys, I know guys that worked in other cities and other parts of the country. Uh, that wasn't in the books for me. I, I just, I had this burning desire to be one of the bravest. And I, I, I wasn't going to go to, uh, DC or and not, not, I'm not, no, no slight to anybody that had one outside of the city limits. But for me, I just wanted to be an FDNY guy. And, uh, you know, I, I was going to stop at nothing and, uh, you know, took, took some determination, but I also, also took luck and lady luck was on my side, man. When I got that letter, I framed it and put it on my wall. Awesome. I couldn't believe I was getting, uh, getting on the job, you know, and the, Proby school was really a lot of fun. Uh, I made up a marching song. And I mean, <laughs> the guys you met back then, uh, you know, I, I have lifelong friends. This whole this whole experience has been uh, really one for the books. I remember when I was a young farmer, I would ride facing forward and I could see the side view mirror and I'd see myself in the mirror. And I couldn't believe I was on a New York City fire truck in one of the five boroughs on this job. It was just, it was amazing. And then when I got promoted, even I'm looking at the mirror saying, I'm in charge of this fire truck and all the guys on it. I mean, how could that be happening? You know, it was just uh, one of the best times, best things that ever happened to me. Truly, truly was. Yeah. It's Camelot, isn't it? Yeah. Oh man, yeah. it is. Yeah. It's amazing. Like it. But, and you know, what's funny. It, Across this country, firemen have the same mindset. Every single one of them. It's crazy. 40 years on a job, the guy's retiring, crying. I don't want to leave. You got to, you know, guys get superannuated on the fire department. You reach a certain age and you know what? They'll look at you and say, don't come in tomorrow. You're too old. And it's, it's like giving someone a, a death sentence. They're like, but, 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 you know, but it's, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle. It really is. And, and it, it's that mindset is across the country. All the guys pretty much think the same way. It's amazing. It really yeah. is. And there was, there was, to your point, Joe Angelini, who, you know, got killed on 9-11, uh, yeah. you know, the anniversary just passed yesterday, 21 years, rescue one fireman, the legendary yep. one at that. Tony Tedeschi was given an interview. It was for the company of hero, a special that aired on CBS. And they were talking mm -hmm. about him and, you know, Tony had said when the Dan Rather, Scott Pelly, I should say, posed the question, um, you know, what about him and, and how much longer did he want to go? And he's and to to your point, Tony said that Joe had told him when he posed the question to Joe, Joe, if not for the age limit, how much time would you want to do on the fire department? He says 50 years because he was going to have to retire by 2003. He would have been right. 65 in 2003. And he uh -huh. did not want to go. He was dreading it. He was dreading it. He wanted no part of retirement. You know, yeah. I had the pleasure of, of working. I don't mean to cut you off. Uh, Go I got detail. Actually, a fellow by the name of Mike Bresciano had the detail in uh, on the, the firehouse, uh, 225 and 107. And I begged him for the detail and he let me take it. And I went to uh, Rescue One for a night tour. And uh, I worked with Joe Angelini. And uh, very quiet, un unassuming guy. And... Uh, I mean, just to be in the guy's presence. And I mean, you know, you want to talk about salty, you know, yeah. the guy was really no emotion. We didn't even, we didn't catch a job. You know, we didn't do anything spectacular, but we had a few runs and everything. And he was very, very, very low key, nonchalant and uh, probably nothing rattled the guy. You know, yeah. I, I didn't have the experience of a fire with him, but it was, it, you ever been in rescue one? I, I, I've been in Manhattan close to it a few blocks away. I've never been to quarters. I, that's one of my, that's one of my bucket list things. I, I've already achieved the emergency service thing on the PD side. Yeah. Next thing is going down on one of the rescues. A good friend of mine is a captain over there. A guy I worked with, uh, in 225 engine, mm -hmm. uh, John Cirillo. But, uh, the amazing thing about that firehouse, which is something I always want to see. And when I got there that night, Joe Angelini was sitting in the kitchen when I walked in, I said, I always wanted to see the back wall of the firehouse. And there it is. Now I'm going back to Brooklyn. But I ended up working a night tour. But when there was a ninth alarm on that block and they lost Rescue One's quarters, the only thing that was standing was the front of the firehouse. 
they took that down piece by piece and they stored it. And when they built the new quarters, that's the back kitchen wall wow. of the firehouse. It, if, if you were standing back, you would expect the door to open up and a fire truck to come rolling right through the kitchen. I mean, that's, that's how it's set up. It is so, so spectacular. It's really cool to see. And for me, it's the history because I, yeah, you, yeah. you know, I, I was saying this when I went, uh, you know, and Billy will understand this and Chet Kennedy, when I went to two truck, you know, and I said to myself, <laughs> these gentlemen also perished on that day 21 years ago. Wow. John DeLara once worked here. Mike Curtin once worked here. Joe Vigiano once walked these halls. Same thing when you go down to rescue one, that would be Joe Angelini once walks these halls, David Weiss, Terry Hatt. Oh, you God, know? Yeah. Think, of, think yeah. of the legends that have walked in that firehouse. It's unbelievable. It's really unbelievable, you know, living legends, you know, some of these guys are still right. around. Yeah. You know, like a Hashagan, for example. Yeah, no doubt. No yeah. Doubt. Or a Malay, even though he doesn't want to consider himself a legend. He has to yeah. be humble I, about it. Don't be humble, Hank. I met Hank yesterday for the first, you know, I shook his hand yesterday because uh, I went to my firehouse. That's where I was on 9-11. So I go there every year pretty much. And then I went over to O'Neill's and uh, I saw a the guys that I know online now, I know in person, you know, and right. uh, it was uh, Hank Malay was sitting there and uh, had the pleasure of talking with him for a little while. And uh, nice guy, you know, yeah, good I, man. I, I couldn't remember him. Like he worked in one seventy five truck in the, in the mid nineties. And uh, he was only there for a year and a half, but uh, I, I, you know, I can't remember, you know, we, we did a lot of work with them guys. We did it. We had a lot of boxes we run in with and face wise. I couldn't remember Hank, you know, from him being, in that neck of the woods, but uh, nice guy, real nice guy. And that's the great thing about what Kevin and Lou do, and, and to a significantly lesser extent myself, is that you know you get to reunite guys that maybe crossed paths and didn't know it, and kind of keep that spirit of the firehouse alive. And, and Billy Kennedy says, you know, to the to your point, he understands this as well with ESU. It's the same thing with the firehouse. If the walls could talk, think of the oh. stories they could tell. That's so true, Billy. It's yeah. it's. That's a very true statement. Actually, um, we we had uh, I, I had worked a lot, many accident scenes and and different uh, car wrecks with uh, the fellows in Seven Truck. They were right on. We were in the same neighborhood hmm. together. In the beginning, it was a little rough, you know. But uh, as time went on, uh, oddly enough, I've been at a few pin jobs where they had their tool working on one side of the car. And we were on the other side and we worked hand in hand in unison and we got the job done together, you know, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, seven truck, seven, seven, five, man, it was great. And I gotta, I gotta say, cause you bring up seven truck cause this is their motto, seven truck feeling lucky. <laughs> I got <laughs> I got I love saying that. So I guess that brings, speaking of sevens, ladder one Oh seven, you're in heaven at ladder one Oh seven. You're in heaven uh, in one Oh seven, staying and alive were, in two, two, five. Right. You stayed alive in 225 for four years, 88 to 92. And then you had the great fortune to spend 11 years in 107. Was 107, and correct me if I'm wrong, were they across the floor or different quarters? Across the floor. Oh. Same firehouse. We, we, were, uh, we were in a 3-9 battalion. There's five companies in the 3-9 battalion, and they're all very good stand-up companies. 290 and 103, single. Yeah, they're a standalone firehouse with no, no battalion. Then you had 236. They were on uh, Sheffield and Livonia. Then you got 236 on Liberty and the Conduit. They were a single engine company that had a tremendous response area. And they did a, a, a bunch of quality first do work. And then you had 225 and 107 with the 39 Battalion. So, uh, you know, all those companies were good. And, uh, you know, going across the floor, I had put my paper in with two years on the job. And then I pulled my paper and uh, what I got for that. Should I stay or should I go now? You know. <laughs> That song, they would serenade me with that. Um, before I got to the truck, I was on onion, onion skin. So the guys in the engine know I wasn't in the engine and I wasn't in the truck yet. So they made me stand between the rigs on roll call. You're not with the engine, but you're not with the truck yet. So, <laughs> so you know. You're at the fork in the road. Uh, I was right between both apparatus. And uh, it was funny. Uh, one of the biggest transfer orders came down and myself and this guy from 123 truck we weren't on the order. We were still on an onion skin after this like three page order came down. And the next Christmas party, I asked uh, Captain Maggio's wife, uh, can you talk to the captain about getting me into the company? And uh, I credit her with getting me into a lot of 107. The captain's wife was my hook. Got me over there. <laughs> She's your rabbi. 
<laughs> she was your rabbi. There you go. Yeah. I mean, as long as you can get there. And that, there, for me, listen, people look at nepotism, and I understand nepotism and bureaucracy can be bad. But if you're putting a guy there that's capable, and if you're putting in somebody that's willing to work, listen, the hook's not a bad thing to have as long as you know that guy or gal is going to do the work. And you certainly did the work. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, um, the beauty of my firehouse was um, they would allow engine guys to do mutuals in the truck. So one of my 24 partners was a, an engine guy that went across the floor. And then we became 24 partners. So half of all of my 24s, I'd be working in the truck. But then if if there was a truck guy paying back a mutual in the engine, he would automatically go back to his company and I would stay in the engine. But I had a lot of exposure as, as a 225 engine man to be working mutuals and, and, and you know, going across the floor uh, for details and stuff. So it was uh, good exposure, you know. I want to talk about aerial operations because it's not as simple as, okay, get into that tiller ladder and take a survey. Yes, that's part of it. You know, you know, analyze the situation, see other things that guys on the ground maybe can't see or guys certainly on the fire floor cannot see. But sometimes in terms of opening up a roof, and this is something that interests me, every building literally is different, not in terms mm -hmm. of its makeup, but in terms of what erosion might have done to it over time. If it's well kept, if it's not well kept, you can cut a certain area of the roof and have success. You can cut a certain area of the roof and it can exacerbate an already volatile situation. So as far as the aspect of cutting, knowing where to cut, knowing when to cut, tell me about that. Um, you know, when, when you become, when you get the position as a roof man, it, it, it's a pretty important part of the whole fire scenario to, to the lay person who doesn't understand what goes on. It's actually, um, they call it controlled chaos, you know, it, to, to the untrained eye, they don't understand what we do and why we do it, but it works in concert with the engine company and the ladder company, your order of arrival, uh, location of the fire and, uh, type of building that you're in. So those three things come into play. And, uh, you know, as a roof firefighter, um, it, it's it, it's stated pretty plainly in in the books that nothing shall deter the roof man from the gaining his position, because uh, there's a saying in the fire service, uh, "Vent and ye shall live." <laughs> so, by you getting up on the top of that building, the first thing you want to do, uh, if you know you have a job in the building, would be to open up all natural points of ventilation. So, if you had a skylight or a scuttle or a bulkhead. Those would be your primary vertical ventilation. Vertical ventilation is acceptable. Horizontal ventilation, a window would have to be in, in concert with a line in place and stuff of that nature. But being on the roof, um, I cut the roof of a building. It was a basement fire and I didn't even ask. I got up on top of the roof. I was taking such a beating with the smoke that I just started the roof and started making holes. I ran the saw out of gas on the roof. That's how many cuts I made in the roof. And, um, you know, optimally you want to get the cut over the fire, you know? So when you get up on the roof, uh, you know, first and foremost, you have to sound the roof to make sure you got, you know, you don't want to go from a ladder, an aerial device or a portable ladder onto a bad roof. So you want to check it and make sure that uh, it's solid. And then uh, you move along gingerly, you know, at times it gets so bad up on the roof that if it's so smoky, you know, get down on your hands and knees and crawl because there's a host of uh, hazards on the roof, you know, clotheslines, cable wires, shafts. Um, they teach you to cross in the front of the building because if you look down a block, usually the fronts of the building all align and in the back you can have different depths of building. And you could be walking along in the smoke and not realize it. And your next step, you're going into a shaft or you're going off a roof. So, but you want it, the optimum place to put the cut is directly over the fire. And you want to try to, if you can, get that cut in a position where you'd get two rooms on that top floor. You know, there's a, they call it expandable coffin cut. Mm. And uh, it's uh, a seven seven nine eight you picture those numbers seven then the nine and then the eight would be the double expansion so the first line you cut is one straight blade and then you overlap 
and you make a vertical cut, your long cut, and then you make a curve cut, and then you'd knock a hole right there and see if fire's there, fire's coming out. If not, if fire's there, you're still going to continue to expand that. That's why they call it an expandable coffin cut. You make those two lines for the seven, then the curve cut, and then you come down one line, and then you bring it over to the long vertical, and that would be a nine looking at it. <laughs> then you pull that section first, and then you continue the cut to make a, you know, two squares, and it's a rectangular looking cut, and hopefully you're over a, a wall, a center wall, and you're able to to vent both rooms on that top floor, you know? And I remember Tim Brown, right before, when he was on the show, right before he went to OEM, one of on one of his last jobs in Rescue 3, like SOC had just been formed, and him and a fellow from Squad 41 were up on the roof. And to your point, if you do it correctly and you analyze it, you know, using utilizing the proper tactics and subsequently analyze it to know where to cut and how to cut it, he was t- telling me that the fellow from Squad 41 and himself, there had been a bunch of maydays below them. Once they started to cut, those maydays stopped, and they were able to alleviate the problems. And that job, all of a sudden, although it's still very difficult, fellas were taking a beating. Obviously, it's a fire. Oh, yeah. It got a hell of a lot easier to manage because of the proper way in which the roof was cut. And and you perform that vertical ventilation, you get a lift. Yeah. Once you start taking skylights and making holes, that smoke has somewhere to go. Right. And what that does, it buys time for the civilians that are that might be trapped inside. And the visibility, and the, it, it, it makes it uh, easier access for the companies that are moving in on the fire floor because you're not in that pizza oven. You know, in the yeah. project fires, it's very hot because everything's masonry and brick. And, and you know, the wood frame buildings, it's, it's different, but they do get hot. And they, you know, um, my very first roof job, uh, it was a vacant building two blocks from the firehouse. And God rest his soul, Danny Labretti was uh, the show from 103. And he had put the stick up, and I had one up uh, uh, off of a portable. And uh, I'll tell you what, when he came up on the roof, man, it was such a relief. He showed me so many things. You know, one of the things to look for, and it, I just remembered it, the tar was boiling on the roof. So that's where the fire is. So that's where you want to make the cut. This roof was so soft and spongy, and I, I was I – was, you know, shaking in my boots a little bit, but Danny Labretti showed up on the roof and uh, he was a calming force and he showed me exactly what to do. And uh, it was really a great experience, you know, but it's, uh, it's tricky up there, just like a- a- all aspects, but it's a very important, you know, nothing mm-hmm. shall deter the roof, man. Nothing, nothing at all. Uh, did you ever get the chance to have one of Danny's meals? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I've, I've worked in, uh, on Sheffield Avenue many times and Danny's come down to the, to our house and, uh, offered to cook. He was such a, a culinary, uh, expert. So, I mean, he was a great cook and he made pastries and stuff, you know, he was a well-rounded guy and and a good fireman as well. He went to rescue too, you know, God rest him. He gave his life on nine 11. And if there's anything I'd love to do, it's to go back in time, take a time machine to like 1998, 1999, go to Rescue Two's kitchen on a night tour when he's working, just so I could have one of his meals. Because I oh, heard man. that man, get, that brother threw down in the kitchen, man. You ain't lying. <laughs> <laughs> and I got For a sure. question here, another one from Stu on uh, the matter of roof cutting. He says, I've listened to several podcasts. I want to ask your opinion of trench cuts as I've heard conflicting opinions on them. Uh, you know, uh they didn't do too many trench cuts in Brooklyn because we didn't have the larger footprint buildings, the H types, the E types. Um, a trench cut is designed to isolate one wing of a building when you got a heavy fire load on the top floor and into the cock loft and the fire is moving along. They're actually, it's a defensive move. And um, I've never been at a job where, where they started a trench, you know, but, uh, from from studying and from reading and and uh you know just hearing stories throughout um if it's done correctly and in a timely fashion it 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 works out wonderful it it isolates the fire to that one wing of the building and and you stop the losses there you know the problem is is a lot of times they they attempt to make a 
uh, a trench cut and then uh, the fire is well advanced and uh, you might have, maybe you should have went to the other side of the throat to buy that, give yourself that much more time because you're working against the moving fire. So in order for you to be successful, you got to, they got to recognize that this is a possibility. It's got to be done early enough in the operation and rapid enough because, uh, you know, if you don't, then you're just wasting time, you know? And, uh, but the whole idea of the trench cut is once you get that trench cut, then you start pulling it and then, uh, you know, then they can get water on the fire from down below and uh, you can make that uh, stop. You know, that's the whole idea behind that trench is to stop that fire from getting to the to the untouched side of the building. And, and very similar in row frame buildings, uh, a row frame building could be up to 20 buildings long and it has a common cock loft throughout all 20 buildings. So you can go to one corner and get up in the attic and I can go to the 20th building, get up in the attic and we can see each other. So once a fire gets up in that common void, it just travels rapidly. So when you have a row frame, a really serious top floor fire, it's not uncommon to write off two or three buildings in the middle and make that trench cut there. And mind you, the building that's two away is not involved at this time, but because of the progression of the fire, they have to write those buildings off in order to, in order to save the block. So to the homeowners that are watching their house enveloped in flame, you know, that's terrible for them, but it, it's a tactical decision that has to be made. And, 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 and with that comes some things that, you know, you just have to do. So trenches are good. They, they, they've been proven to work, but um, it's just a matter of, you know, getting it getting it done early and uh, being in that position to be ahead of that fire. Because if not, you, you know, then then it doesn't work. And then you the attempt that, you know, if it's a, if it's an E type building, you have two more one more throat after that one to maybe make a stand there, you know. But it's all it's all situational. It's all operational. Never had the uh, the pleasure of doing that, but I do know uh, in, in many, many, many fires, it's been very successful, but it's in, not without labor. <laughs> in short, if you don't do well with it, it could turn into, as our buddy Lou would say, we didn't do so good here. <laughs> Swing and a miss, yeah. he struck him out. <laughs> exactly. You know, and the, the, the thing is with, with the fire game is even when we do things 100% correct, we still suffer losses yeah. and things still go wrong. It's just the nature of the beast. You know, it's, it's a dangerous job. And I think it was Chief Fian that said this years ago. They interviewed him back in like 91, 92. And he was saying, no matter how hard we train, no matter what equipment we bring into the fold, there's going to be that next one because it's just the nature of the job. You don't want it to happen. It breaks your heart when it does, okay. whether if you're on the job or if you're a buff like myself. But still, you know, it's it, can you can you take preventative measures? Can you be proactive? Of course. But there's so many names on that wall. You know, yeah. and it's good. It, same thing is true for the police department. It's just the nature of the job. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I will say, you know, during your time in Brooklyn, of course, Rescue Two's there. They got the elite history on their side. And they, under Downey, and this is no disrespect to their previous captains, uh, Fred Gallagher really did a great job with them, too. But under Downey, they became the technical rescue gurus that they are today. So you have them, and obviously they're still there on major fires. And then you have later on in 1998, Squad 252 with Eddie Metcalf as his original captain. Yeah, good team. friend. A good man, Eddie Metcalf. I'm trying to get him on this show. He won't pick up my calls, Eddie, so get back to me. But, I'll text uh, him for you. <laughs> please do. i am trying to get him for a while. But um, you have them. I think Squad 1's also. Were they absorbing the SOC, too, when it was formed in 98? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, so you have them. How often would you find yourself, especially with two, how often would you find yourself assisting them at fires? Um, you know, the, we, we have our job and our assignments and they have their job and their assignments. Uh, you know, when rescue got into any of our boxes, uh, you know, if, if the chief saw a need to put them to work, he would put them to work. And, uh, you know, we, it, it, all the first two companies, it's not that we don't, I mean, I love all the, I love every aspect of the job, but let's face it, you, you know, you don't want, you know, a sock company coming in and, and trying to mop up something that you guys are trying to do, you know, uh, right. uh, they have a place on the fire ground and, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm at, 
at no point am I begrudging them at all, you know, but uh, in certain areas of the city, uh, you know, they get in and uh, they're used more. Uh, in the areas where, you know, the area that I worked in, it's just uh, all the companies are very aggressive. All the companies are very uh, well trained and in tune to, uh, you know, the business at hand. So um, it's a pride thing, you know. It's more of a pride thing than anything else. But I, I went to, I interviewed at Rescue 2 uh, after the towers came down. And uh, I sat with Captain Rubolo and uh, they were looking for eight guys. And he told me that, you know, he asked me if I was on a list. I told him, you know, yeah, I want to get promoted. So uh, I ended up not going because uh, the captain and, 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 and you know, he, he was right in saying this. He didn't want to water down rescue. They needed eight guys. So he wasn't going to take eight guys all at once. He was going to take four guys now and four guys later. Right. And I don't know if I would have been in that second four guys, but in the interim, I stayed in my firehouse. The last two guys that I kind of broke in uh, along with the whole firehouse, you know, any probies, we all train them. We all help them. But this fellow, Mike Leo, who's now a captain uh, in the uh, drone unit, and he was a squad. He left 107 to go to the squad. But Mikey Leo was one of uh, the last probies I trained, along with this fellow, Danny Stafford. And, uh, you know, I did interview, and the guys didn't give me the business about it. And it turned out, uh, you know, I got promoted before um, I got – I don't know if I would have ever got the call, but I got promoted. And uh, I left Lincoln Avenue uh, as, as a lieutenant instead of transferring to rescue and then leaving rescue, you know. But uh, – it kind of worked out well, but I, after 9-11, I, I, I definitely wanted to go to a rescue company. And, uh, you know, Rescue 2 is in Brooklyn. I was a Brooklyn guy. And then when I became a lieutenant, I I had a, I seen Rescue 1 all the time in Midtown. And, uh, I definitely uh, had my – it was in the back of my head that at some point when I got a little more experience as a company officer, I would have uh, liked to try to throw my hat in the ring. Yeah, and, of course. Uh, you know, you know, it's funny, uh, this f- friend of mine, he's the captain of 255 engine. When I went to interview with uh, the rescue, uh, when I came back, he said, hey, his name's Ricky Galizzi, by the way. He goes, hey, did you call anybody? And I said, no, man, I want to get there on my own merit. And he's like, come on, bro, you know, you got to have a rabbi, you know. And uh, <laughs> you mentioned the, the rabbi term before. And you know, I didn't think to call anybody, you know. Maybe if I called somebody, I would have got there. I don't know, but. Things, things worked out fine. You know, I, I went there with good intentions and uh, I ended up getting promoted out of uh, my home base, which is, uh, there's no other, to me, and, and the funny thing is, is you talk to 95% of the guys in a job and they'll tell you the same thing. You know, that first house is your home and you never forget it. And, uh, you know, you always gravitate there. And that, that's where all your memories are, most of them. Yeah. You know, because that's, yeah. that's, it's kind of like your first girlfriend. You know, yeah. you just never, even though you move on, there's different relationships and then you meet the one and that, yeah. and the one's great. You never forget your first, you know? Yeah. That's, that's an interesting analogy. It is. Thankfully, there's no ex-girlfriends out there for me that are going to kill me. And I have upon <laughs> using that analogy so I can use it freely. Yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but that said, you know, of course, um, yeah, at, to your point on training after 9-11, training was so imperative because it's not just losing these guys, these great, great guys. It's the knowledge that perished with them and you can't replace that. So naturally they're looking at guys like you that have 15 years on, they're looking at guys that even if they're not in an authoritative rank, like Lieutenant, like captain, but have a lot of time on our senior guys. And they're really throwing and investing so much into them because it's like, and it's a lot of pressure, but it's necessary. Listen, these guys are coming in now that don't know, anything from Adam, you got to be the one now to train them. You got to be the one now to bring them up to speed. And I imagine that even though it was tough and there was a lot of pressure, you felt like you were doing it for those 34, 343 guys, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, you have to train on this job because you don't like the warrior guys. It was trial by fire. Those guys showed up at work. They went to three jobs in a night tour. That was your training. You would, you would just, that's how you learn. So when, when the fire duty is down, uh, you got to train to stay sharp. You know, I, I was a big proponent of, of 
telling guys to scenario based train, you know, when, when you're training, put yourself in a scenario in your mind, you could be sitting at home thinking about a scenario. If this would happen, I'm going to try this. If that happens, I might try that always scenario based train so that your mind is always thinking this way. When something presents itself, oddly enough, it might've been a scenario that you trained in your head that you, you you've come up with some possible solutions you know, or, or it might be a firsthand experience, but, you know, knowledge is wealth. Knowledge is wealth in, in the world, but on the fire ground, you know, there, there's a saying in the fire department that the day I stop learning is the day I hang them up. Every day's a learning day, you know, and uh, I always told the, the, the younger firemen, you know, open the books, read engine operations. If you're in the engine, read if you're in a towel ladder or, or read ladders three. Those things, that knowledge is going to help you to be a better fireman, you know, and, and uh, you have to train, you know, training, train, train to live and live to train. And, and you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a common term that you'll hear. And uh, that's, that's the only way to, to try to hone your skills, you know, and then you catch a job here or there, then you practice what you learn. What's the old Tommy Brennan line? You can you hear it a lot on Salty. You can never learn enough about a job that can kill you. Yep, exactly. Doesn't hurt, doesn't hurt to know. No. It hurts not to know, but it, it one hundred percent hurts not to know. It's just you know you're there. You know you got you got to you got to be a sponge. You gotta you know when I was a young firefighter, I would make it a point in a double house to to try to get each and every guy that was at that job and ask them. What'd you do? What'd you see? How'd you get there? Just for my own knowledge. And another thing I want to bring up, um, you know, when I got on the job, I'd be on the back step and there'd be a guy with 21 years, 17 years, 15 years, and me with a year. You know, there came a time in the job, oh, we were at, sitting at dinner one night and we sit next to this guy, John Brown. He was the captain of 102, retired. He looked at me, he goes, get in the sink, Bob. And before I told him to up yours, Brown, I looked around that kitchen table and with 10 years on the job, I was the junior guy working 10 years. Then I got promoted. I went to a firehouse. I had 14 years when I got promoted and total up both back steps of both companies. And they had nine years total between all the guys working. Wow. And I, me with 14 years, I had more time than nine guys. So, you know, it, it, it's it's a circle, you know, and, and, and they'll do a large hiring and then there'll be a span without hiring. And then it, it just keeps on repeating itself. So there's always an influx. At some point, you'll have a, a, a very high influx of newer personnel. And then when the hiring kind of stalls, then, then guys get time. And, you know, that's how it goes but it's, it, it always repeats itself. No, we talked about it earlier, the evolution of the job. And it's so funny because you go from gravita gravitating towards these senior men when you come on to now you're in a position, time flies, they're gravitating towards you and they're wanting to learn from you. And you're like, wow, man, I've been here 14, 15 years. Now I could start teaching guys. And most people genuinely want to teach because, you know, listen, when you leave, it doesn't even have to be when you pass away or anything like that. Just when you retire, you don't want that knowledge to leave with you. There's nothing that says that when you hang them up, you have to hang up the knowledge too and keep shut. No, guys are eager. They're practically begging you in general to give them some knowledge, you know, and it's a cycle. You talk about cycles down the road when they have time on the job, they're going to say, Hey, I remember when Caraba showed me this, he was a good senior guy. I'm going to tell you what he told me. Yeah. I'll, uh, you know what? I, and, I was at the firehouse uh, yesterday and there was a, a young female uh, firefighter from 236 that had the detail to lot of 107 and she was uh, checking out the rig and I went over and said hello like hey, congratulations how long are you on the job and you know she told me I got just about a year on a job I said listen remember one thing everybody starts this job the same way one day one week one month mm -hmm. so you're no different than anybody else you know just uh, enjoy the ride. Before you know it, you're going to have time under your belt. And I mean, she was grateful. And it was cool to, you know, to see 
I mean, I'm, I'm an older guy now, you know, I'm looking at these, you know, she probably was maybe 23 to 25, you know, and she was young and, uh, you know, she was very impressionable and, and, uh, from watching her checking out the rig, she was very much into what she was doing. And that, that's really cool to see, you know? Exactly. Yeah. No, and, and she'll get to a point in her career where she could probably train other firemen. Absolutely. I go, I, I go back to the picture that Lou posted on Instagram the other day, and I think Facebook too, probably. It's him and Coops in front of the squad 288 rig in 1998. You know, there yeah. was, at that time, Lou had five years, Kevin had three. And fast forward, Lou's a lieutenant down the road in 288. He's probably training guys. You know, they were learning from Hank when they first got there. Now Coobs is the senior man, and he's training guys. So it's a beautiful exactly. process as long as you're willing to uphold it. And are there going to be guys, and this was every every job, it goes in one ear, comes out the other, yeah. But for the most part, it's such good information. And I, what I love about the fire department is, especially the New York City Fire Department, there is such an obligation. And it's not necessarily spoken, it's just understood, to upholding tradition, to upholding the values. And I've always admired that about the FDNY. Absolutely. Um, the, the unfortunate thing about that statement there, Mike, is eventually, eventually, a lot of the traditions that were passed on to me and I pass them on to others, just by sheer attrition and time, there's, you know, sooner or later, some things are going to start falling by the wayside because there's not going to be someone in your ear telling you that they'll, they'll get a to a point where this person that's passing on knowledge is never heard about senior man rules. And, you know, it's going to be different. Unfortunately, it's going to be different, but I, I hope and pray that whenever I, 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 I had the, the, the honor of teaching at the Proby Academy, fire Academy before I retired. And I used to tell the, the Proby's three things, always be in position and ready to go to work. The senior man rules, if you're not sure that he's giving you good information, find the next senior man and ask them. And third, most importantly, is the traditions of the job. Anything that you're taught traditionally, you must pass it on to the generations that come after you. You know, and that all goes to knowledge as well. Share what you know, show people, you know. Right. But uh, unfortunately, uh, probably not in my lifetime, but I, I can probably almost be assured that. Uh, some of the things traditionally will not be the same in, in years to come, you know, just by sheer line, time. Right. But the silver lining is this. New traditions will be born. Oh, and yeah. Those traditions will be upheld. And like we talked about earlier, not to sound redundant, but the cycle will continue. Mm -hmm. you know? And there'll be a different right. definition of old school. Old school doesn't necessarily have to go away. It just takes on a new meaning with time. You know, you know Mike, and I'm glad you pointed that out because, I, you know, I had my blinders on there and, uh, yeah, there'll be new traditions down the road and uh, that, you know, they're definitely going to evolve and, and do things differently. And uh, that'll be their battle cry, you know. Yeah. But uh, good point. Yeah, I like that. Thank you. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm good for a couple of points here and there. It's, it's <laughs> everything else is crap that comes out of my mouth. But every now and then I'll have a gem or two, a diamond in the rough. <laughs> I guess so, that was one of them. Don't sell yourself short, Mike. You're doing uh, a great service. And uh I mean, you, you've you taken podcasts to a different level by, you know, the, the salty guys are doing fantastic and they're, they're, fi they're fired. You're, you're talking to firefighters, you're talking to police officers, you're talking to politicians. You know, you, you got you got your you got your irons in the fire and you're going in a good direction, man. Don't sell yourself short. Well, I appreciate that. A couple more things I want to hit on. And I'll flip the question that Tony Tedeschi asked of Joe Angelini. You know, you retired late 04, right before 05, if not for age limits or injuries or anything, much like Tony asked Joe, how much, how much time would you have done? Would you still be there right now? You know what? Um, I'd like to think that's a strong possibility. Maybe one more rank, maybe. Uh, my, when my, my game plan getting on was I got on at 30. I'd go to 25 years and retire at 55. You know, that was... That was my game plan early on in the program. But, um, of course, uh, the cards that I got dealt had uh, different plans. And uh, uh, I was a promoted guy working in uh, in uh, Midtown and the uh, third division. And I had a UFO spot. UFO stands for until further orders. 
So I had a UFO spot in 65 engine. I wanted a ladder company, but I was asked by the officer assignment desk, would I take this spot in 65? They were looking for some continuity because uh, they only had the captain and, and one other lieutenant. The other two lieutenants were on medical leave. So I went in there, not begrudgingly, happy to do it. I, I took the spot and I'll tell you what, man, I had a really great time over there at 65 engine. And uh, that's where I got caught on a company medical. We went for, for medicals I, and I knew I had a problem, but I didn't want to own up to it. You know, I had an inhaler in my turnout coat pocket. I had an inhaler in my car had an inhaler in my locker, but you know, I, I knew that sooner or later they were going to catch up to me. And, um, and uh, I got to tell you, man, I cried the day I, I got retired. I cried like a baby because this was my lifelong dream. And, um, you know, I, I, I got the, the, the astute honor of saying I was on the team, you know, I, I made it. I, I'm an, I'm one of the bravest, right. but, uh, you know, I would, when I hear, when I see guys do 40, 42 years and get out, I'm quite envious and you know, I'm happy for them. But, you know, I just wish, you know, you, you, a guy with 40 years doesn't want to leave. You think a guy with 17, two years in rank, you know, but I mean, I didn't even, my breathing was so bad back then that they didn't, the job didn't even give me the methylcholine challenge because my numbers were so low to begin with. And when they give you a methylcholine challenge, they introduce an an irritant into your airway, and then you you spike down. But my numbers were so low, they were afraid to give me that irritant because it might put me into uh, some sort of cardiac or respiratory arrest. And uh, so they what they did was chart my numbers low, and then they gave me the inhaler, and I spiked up. So the way that Dr. Wyden explained it to me, it was like a reverse methylcholine challenge. So uh, mm -hmm. when I found out I was going to go on uh, – light duty and then LSS limited service status. Um, you know, I, I tried everything in my power to stay on a job and uh, it just wasn't in the cards, you know, and uh, that that day will never leave my body. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I can shut my eyes and be right there. And uh, the fellow that told me that I was being retired, I worked with his brother mm. in, in my firehouse. It's, uh, so it was, you know, he put his hand out to congratulate me on my retirement. And I actually turned on a 90 degree angle. I had my right hand behind me and I'm looking at him going, you are congratulating me on losing my career. He put his hand down, looked at me and said, no one's ever said that to me before. Wow. And then, uh, you know, the next, the very next morning at 0900, I was a civilian. It was a really hard pill to swallow. But... Um, I, I, I'm, you know, I did 17. I'm out 17. They're not calling me back, but I, I'd love one more night to them, man. <laughs> Every guy on a job would, you know, it's crazy. It's crazy. But, and uh, again, again, you, you don't find any other people that think that way, you know, and, and this is no knock to any other emergency professions, but even the, some of the guys in the police department will tell you, you know, they don't feel the same way. Some of them do. But no, not right. you know, there's quite, you know, more more on the fire side. Do they feel the same? Uh, do they feel that way? I should say about the profession to where you'll get a guy that's doing everything. You, I mean, look at you and your asthma. You know, it brings me back. I'm a Yankee fan. Paul O'Neill, at the end of his career, had so many injuries. He would hide from Joe Torre. He would do everything to make sure Joe Torre didn't find him in the stadium to say, "Hey, Paulie, I'm not going to put you in the lineup tonight" because he wanted to play so bad. Yeah. And that was you with the ass. But think about that. Right. You're fighting through a legitimate health condition because you love the job so much, it, you know? And It's insane. It's insane. It, 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 I, I said this many times, but where do you find a, a group of guys that's working for 10 years and it's not busy enough? They want to go somewhere else. I know guys with 10 years on a job, they look, you know, other professions, even, you know, not, not in, the, in the first responder world. That, you know, after 10 years, they're like, well, let's pull the reins back a little and slow down. And in the fire service, everybody's like, let's keep going. You know? Right. Let's do it's more. Amazing. Yeah, let's do more. I need I need the action. I'm thriving. You know, I need the action. And you can't chase fires. You know, if yeah. you're in you're in some part of Queens and they're busier on the other side of Queens and you put a paper in over there. Once you get over there, you're going to hear them fighting fires where you just came from, you know. You just got to ride out the, the slow times and wait for the busy times. And 
in a 20 year career, 17 year career. I mean, it, it, it comes full circle. It really does. Yeah. So you can't chase fires, just wait for them to happen. And they happen when you least expect it. You know, one, well, I had a one run night and it was a fatal fire. And, uh, a lot went on at that job, man. It was crazy, crazy. I, I had the outside vent. I, uh, I did a move on a, on a roof. I pulled, I did a 20 up and over, dragged the ladder to the back. As soon as I got to the rear, my first transmission was an urgent to the battalion. It was a civilian hanging out the rear window. And by the, I tried, I tried to make a move to get the ladder down and it was three stories in the rear and two in the front. So my ladder wasn't long enough. I had to go up over the fire building to the exposure down through the backyard. It was, you know, you got a, but it was a one run night, you know, quiet as can be. And if, Five o'clock in the morning, this box came in, and it was a fatal fire, and we lost a guy, a civilian. So you just never know, you know. And I guess that's the final thing that we could hit on before I get to the rapid fire. You know, we talked about it off the air. Let's get into it a little bit on the air about the counseling because peer support. Now, I love there are a lot of it. I've said this before, and I'll say it again, not to sound like a broken record. There's a lot of negative evolutions within society occurring right now, but one of them that is a positive is we're talking more and more about mental health, which is so good, especially for first responders, police and fire. Even though you guys love what you do, you saw so many things that nobody should ever have to see. And most people in a lifetime, thankfully, never do see. And that's not always easy. And guys have a hard time with it. It affects their family lives. It affects their personal lives. And you've been so active with that, helping members of the service, which is so awesome. So, so tell me about how you got involved with that. It's actually a funny story. Um, when I got out of the job, I was doing fire safety consulting. I was working for a company that did high-rise fire drills and high-rise office building. This is all predicated on the Triangle Shirtwaist factory fire. All these laws came in after that horrific fire. And uh, it was Local Law 5 mandated high-rise buildings to do fire drills, and have log records, and so on and so forth. So I did that for five years. And all the while I was doing that, I kept making calls into the counseling unit to try to get an interview to become a peer counselor. And uh, he'll rename nameless, but I was using a friend of mine's name who was at the counseling unit. And unbeknownst to me, him and the guy that was running the counseling unit, never they didn't really get along. So every time my name dropped this fellow's name, I never got a phone call. So I'm doing fire safety consulting and a friend of mine is uh, once a month, they do, uh, they do uh, once a week, they do uh, an AA meeting at the counseling unit. And a friend of mine was speaking at the meeting and I was a fire safety consultant. He's like, why don't you come down and have lunch and uh, watch me share. I, I, since then I have quit drinking as well, but at the time I was drinking and, you know, so I went and I saw the, uh, the meeting and then afterwards, we're standing on the curb outside and two fellas pull up who are peer counselors. This guy, Dave Gettins and uh, this guy, Joe Donovan. And uh, at the time, back then, they were, they got a department car to drive around to the firehouse. So they got out and then we shook hands. I introduced myself. My friend Jimmy had known these guys. And uh, they said that, hey, you know, that they're, they're looking for guys. So I'm like, I've been trying to get a foot in the door for five years. So they said, call him right now. So I called up and, and Frank Lito was upstairs and I had never met the guy until this day. And I said, yeah, Frank, my name is Ronnie Caraba. I'm interested in, uh, you know, trying to become a peer counselor. He goes, well, you have to come in, you know, come in and sit down with me. I says, I'm outside on the sidewalk right now. He goes, well, come on upstairs. So I went upstairs and I sat down with him. And one of the first things he asked me was, where would you work? I said, I worked in Ladder 107. He goes, my father was a lieutenant there. So if I would have known that 10 years ago and said 107, I would have got my foot in the door five years earlier. But yeah, as everything happens for a reason. And I ended up uh, getting into uh, the peer counseling unit uh, as a peer. And uh, in the beginning, what I did, the first time I ever went out, um, it was with two guys who were peer counselors. And I would mirror them, just watch them. We go into a firehouse and we pitch the firehouse. We talk about drinking, drugging, family problems, and so on and so forth. And uh, we had discussed earlier before we came on on the air that uh, you know they had a suicide awareness program. They have all these different programs, and um, you know this whole thing about mental health. Um, 
there was a time in the New York City Fire Department when the counseling unit was a dumping ground. They just got rid of problem firemen, put them there. They were, after 9-11, they really came into their own, you know. They saw 10,000 family members after 9-11 and helped countless, countless, countless firefighters in, in, in all ranks, every rank, from the proby to chief of department and anywhere in between, uh, all, all types of uh, personnel have been through those doors for different things. And, and if you think about the premise, it, it's a wonderful idea in the fact that I walk like a duck, I talk like a duck, I quack like a duck. I walk into a firehouse kitchen, it's instant credibility. Oh, you taught me in the proby school. Hey, we got on the job together. We got promoted together. So you, you, first of all, us as peers, we're in our own environment, the firehouse kitchen, right? And uh, coming from guys from within the job or personnel, because there's female peers now, and now actually the job has full duty firefighters and company officers that are peers. Because if the need is immediate, they can go to the diamond plate, look on the roster of all the guys working throughout the five boroughs and locate peers that are on duty at that very moment. And they can get them to that area as quickly as possible where, where the need arises. But, um, you know, uh, it, the premise is right there, you know, and, and, and the guys, we pitch them, we talk about what is the programs that are offered to them. And we leave business cards on the table and we wish everybody to have a safe tour. And usually as we walk out of the kitchen on our way out to the firehouse, that's how we, we get people, they approach us. Hey, listen, uh, and it doesn't have to be the member's problem. It could be his wife, adult children in his household. We, 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 uh, the, the council unit paints with a broad brush, you know, and they'll, they'll help out a lot of different people within your family if, if it fits the narrative. But uh, it, it, and our job as peers, I make it very clear when I'm pitching a firehouse is I have the same degree as you guys in this kitchen, you know, chopping onions and breaking shoes. You know, I, I, I'm not a clinician. I don't have any kind of mental health background. I'm just a messenger. And I speak from firsthand experience. When I was on the job, I, I used the counseling unit for myself. And I, I, I was dealing with a uh, my brother who had a drinking problem, we had to live together after both of us got divorced. I didn't know how to handle that situation. They gave me the uh, knowledge and the information I needed to better equip me. And then uh, in turn, you know, later on in my life, I had to come to the realization that, you know, I, I wasn't doing so good with the drinking. And I, I used the counseling unit and uh, they helped me along with that as well, you know. So. This whole idea, we did have that podcast with the mental health show, and um, it's getting that, that elephant out of the room, you know, the stigma, because there was a time on this job, if you went to ask for help, they would put a CD30 on your locker, which is a transfer paper, you know, you don't have what it takes, get lost, go somewhere else, you know, it was that kind of an atmosphere, right. you know, but now uh, we're, we're trying to make it, it, it is acceptable. But a, a lot of people are worried, you know, if I come forward and say I have a drug problem or an alcohol problem, they're going to, I'm going to get canned. I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to lose my career. And the beauty of this is, is if you go willingly and you ask for help, you are protected by law. They can't fire you because you're asking for help, you know? So I'm, mean, there's, if you're a repeat offender and, and there's, there's certain fireable offenses, but I'm going to say well over 90%, 95%, if you ask for help, you're going to get help and your job will not be in jeopardy unless you put it in jeopardy. So that's a reassurance that we try to, to let firefighters know when we're pitching a kit, you know, we're talking, we let them know what's available, what, what you can expect and, and just to have an open mind, you know, uh, we talk in, in terms, you know, you tell a guy you know, pitching a fly house, yeah, hey, hey, if you have a problem with your shoulder, you go to an orthopedic guy. If you're having chest pains, you go to a cardiologist. If mentally you're not prepared and you're not 100%, you have to address that. Because while you're on duty, you have to be fit for duty across the board, physically and mentally. 
if you if you if there's something eating at you that's going to prevent you from doing your job you have to come to that realization because you know there's five positions in the truck and there's five positions in the engine if one guy doesn't do their job that affects the outcome of that operation because now one part of the puzzle or one part of that that operation is not being completed and 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 you're you, you become a part of the problem instead of part of the solution if, if you're not mentally prepared to 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 be a hundred percent you have to come to that realization and you have to ask for help it, and there's no shame in my game i i I've, I've asked for help on the job and off the job and it's uh you know we're getting that we're getting that stigma we're getting rid of it we're trying to yeah one of the beauties of the getting salty podcast is i met a fella by the name of mike matter and he's a dearborn michigan fireman they started within the last year they started their own peer counseling team and i i put him in touch with frank Lido to pick his brain because he is he's the uh the, the highest authority i know in, the, in that realm and uh i don't know if they ever really talked but i gotta tell you man he hit this guy hit the ground running they he's got a lot of posts going on and a lot of good 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 positive feedback so you know what what once was a you know taboo is now uh it's on the kitchen table and it's it's a talkable subject and it's something that uh everybody's got to realize that if, if you need the help you got to ask for it there's a saying that goes in in emergency services is uh you know lord help my mind forget what my eyes have seen you know and what we do is cumulative you know we see it there's another term called gallows humor we see something horrific and we make light of it that's in, in reality you're dumping it you know you're getting rid of it you, you just see the way that guy's leg was wrapped around it you know whatever it is you talk about it and you're off gassing, you know, but the Gallo Zuma thing that, that can only get you so far, you know, and after a while you have to come to the realization and there's people out there that can help you. So raise your hand, ask for help and you'll get it and, and you'll be a better person for it. And uh, you go back to full duty and you can uh, live to ride that shiny red fire truck again and have the time of your life. I love it. And it's especially after the last two years, look at what these guys and gals in the front lines have been through with COVID, you know, oh, yeah. well, especially horrific. now they need to talk. You know, uh, I'll touch on that briefly. Um, during COVID, the peer counselors were not allowed to do in-person visits. So what they did was I had three battalions. I had like 17 fire companies. And instead of visiting them every Monday morning, I would go down the list from the first firehouse to the 17th firehouse. And part of us uh, reaching out was we had to talk to company offices and then we had to talk to senior men, not just getting from the company offices, their angle, because the firefighters see things a little differently. So I would call a firehouse and I, I'd get the, I knew the delegate in the engine. I knew the delegate in the truck. I would reach out for them. And then I would talk to company offices and, you know, just check in on them, let them know the council unit's still open and we're here to help and so on and so forth, you know, but during those times, I mean, the, the amount of, of loss of life that these companies dealt with on their every single day, horrific 10, 11, 12, 15. I don't know. I don't know the exact numbers, but, very easily could have been into double digits on a 24 of people yeah. dying of COVID. And it just, it, it takes a toll on you. And then getting those guys, no, they're the frontline workers. They, they get infected. They get into COVID, you know, it, it some of them have even passed away themselves, unfortunately. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it was a, it was a very difficult two years for sure. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. It's, you know, it's, it's in the rear view mirror, so to speak, but, uh, yeah. I mean, just when, I mean, you thought 9-11 was going to be the end all, you know, the, the, the most horrific thing ever. And, and not, not to make light of that, of course, but now look at the COVID pandemic, what it did for two years. I mean, it shut the country down. It shut the planet down. And they were going to work every single day in, in the line of fire, doing their job, both fire and EMS. 
It's amazing. It's a testament to all of them, you know? Yeah. Greatest yeah. fire department in the world. I, 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 I like that saying, you know? <laughs> but uh, if you, you'll talk to a guy in Chicago, he'll tell you his is the best. And just like <laughs> in the fire, my companies are the best companies on the planet. But you talk to the guys on Sheffield Avenue, they'll tell you the same thing. And in the Bronx and Queens and Staten Island, it's 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 all about pride, you know, having mm -hmm. pride in yourself and pride in your company. This has been awesome. And uh, we'll yeah. end as we always end with the rapid fire. And it's five hit run questions for me, five hit run answers from you. Are you ready? I'll do my best. All right. You can say pass if you want. First, favorite rig you ever rode on, favorite model? Um, a 1966 Mac CF95, five speed. Double clutch transmission, open cab fire truck. Sounds pretty that, good. Now, everything's automatic now. You know, I mean, and I, I drove that truck. I pumped my first fire. They charged my hose bed. The entire hose bed was filled with water. <laughs> but <laughs> with 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 a, a manual transmission and a steering wheel that's about four inches, 40, 48 inches across, it was. Oh, both feet, both hands, everything was going at one time. So that was definitely uh, the coolest truck I ever rode on. <laughs> Second, besides the great job you mentioned earlier when you were in EMS and saving that gentleman's life when he was having a heart attack, besides that job, what was the most uplifting call you ever responded to? Um, actually, just, uh, you know, th th there's too many to know. You know, just at the end of a fire to have somebody come up to you or, or an emergency and just thank you for being there and thank you for doing what you did. You know, I, I just can't put it on one, one, one popped into my head, but it wouldn't be fair because it would slight the other ones. But I had an EMS run in the volleys and uh, it was a car accident. And it was uh, a kid with a pretty bad injury to his eye. And uh, he had asked me to give him a needle to take the pain away. And I, I, I covered the area with a gauze, gauze, and I, I put cool saline water over this injury, and it, it brought a smile to his face, and he thanked me right on the spot. The kid had to be seven or eight years old, but can you imagine him asking for a needle? You know, and uh, so that one, you know, I was involved in simultaneously involved in a in a rescue as well, where my my twin brother had responded from another part of town and I was I responded from home and uh, simultaneously both of us were involved in the rescue of uh, two children who later passed away from their injuries but I didn't know that my brother was there he didn't know I was there and we were both involved uh, simultaneously at the same time so that that was a pretty notable moment as well you know I would say third and this is why I say you could say pass in the event it can't be told on this show funniest call you ever responded to Oh, Jesus. Uh, we were on uh, Linden Boulevard, and there was a minor car accident. And uh, this young guy was given the, the old man that ran into the back of his car a really hard time. He was being very aggressive verbally. Yeah, I know where you live. I'm going to get you. And he was making threatening the guy's life and everything. So me being the quiet person I am, of course, I started talking to this guy, telling him, yo, you know, calm. I, I got I, I got loud and boisterous and we're yelling back and forth. And the guy threatened. He threatened us. He goes, I know where you guys work. I'll come by, you know. And while I'm arguing with the guy, the drunk old guy is urinating on the back of my fire truck. So that was pretty damn funny. I'm trying to defend this guy against getting beat up, and that's how he paid me back. So. And there you go. That was his way of saying thank you. <laughs> yeah. My goodness. Fourth, when you're in New York City, favorite bar or restaurant to go to? Oh, uh, McSawley's Ale House is a really there. cool, cool place. And do you know the folklore of the stigma behind that bar? No, tell me. If you. If you look up, there's lighting fixtures that hang over the bar. And on one of the lighting fixtures is a bunch of wishbones. And I had told Hank Malay this yesterday. And on top of the wishbones is about four inches of dust. And the folklore of those wishbones were that men that went off to fight in World War I and World War II would 
would place that wishbone on top of that lighting fixture. And upon their return, they would retrieve it and snap it for good luck. And the ones that remained are the ones that never came home to retrieve those uh, wishbones. So, but just the atmosphere of McSully's, that that was a, a, a men's only bar till like 1979 or 80, 81. Then it became a co-ed bar, but it only had one restroom. So men and women use the same restroom. And then eventually they added a, a woman's restroom to, to the, uh, to that location. But it, I, when I, when I was drinking, that was a fun place to go. I imagine there was a baby boom for a period there in the early eighties when they were having the same restroom. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows how many New York city children have been conceived at the bar. Allegedly. I don't know. We'll say allegedly. allegedly. <laughs> there you go. Fifth and finally, you know, if you can grab somebody you're right out of the rock, they just got on the job. What would you tell that guy or gal, knowing everything that you know about the job? You know, I, I've I've told this to many. Uh, don't blink, because your career is going to fly by you so fast, you're not going to believe it. And then when you retire, it goes into warp speed. Time goes faster than that. You know, well, I yearned and wanted that job for my whole adult, my whole life. And I finally got it. <clears throat> and when I got on, <clears throat> you know, the drudgery is the proby school. It's the worst part of the job. You know, and once you get to your firehouse, it's amazing. And the time goes really, 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 really goes. Warp speed, actually. And, Why is uh, that? Because you're having fun. It, you know what? It, because... You go to work every day with a smile on your face. You know, if you love your job, that's half your pay. So I started out with $28,000. That first year I was making 50,000 because every day I went to work with a smile. I never said, ah, oh, I don't want to go to work. You know, I always look forward to every single tour. It, it really is, you know, those who know, know, and those who don't know, it, it's hard. To, to convey and, and make them, excuse me, understand. But for all those who raised their, their right hand and took that oath, uh, we all know, and we all have this big smile on our face that doesn't go away, you know? I would say this has been a fantastic podcast. Stick around, we'll say goodbye off the air. Before I say goodbye to the audience, uh, is there any shout outs you want to give to anyone or anything? Uh, no, uh, you know, the band, I'll shout out the Pipes and Drums band because uh, I was down there last night. I took my wife. She'd never been to the Twilight show and it was raining, but it didn't dampen the mood and it didn't, uh, you know, it was, it was awesome. Yeah, we spoke and uh, hopefully next year, Mike will be standing right next to each other when, when the show kicks off. But uh, just as a whole, I mean, everything about this job, and everything you hear say about this job, it's all true. You know, it is, it has been my honor, my pleasure. You know, I told you, I taught at the rock my last year, I stood in front of three probie classes. I imparted what I learned. I gave it to them willingly and freely. And uh, hopefully they're carrying on that tradition, you know, just, it's not a job, it's a lifestyle. And uh, every guy almost, 99 and nine tenths of the guys and girls feel the same exact way. So that's what I got, Mike. I appreciate you uh, asking me to come on the show. It's definitely been uh, a great experience and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you. I thank you for making the time. It's one thing to reach out. You never know if these guys are going to say yes. Most of them do. Some of them <laughs> don't. But anytime you get the chance to have these guys on, on both department sides, the PD and the FD, and hear these stories, I always come away with a gigantic smile on my face because I'm so grateful to know you guys and to you know, the trust, just the trust that you guys have to share these stories with me. It's always an honor. Always an honor. Absolutely. You're doing, a, you're doing a fantastic job. You know, you heard me. Uh, I told the guys on Getting Salty, you know, you're hitting out of the park. You're, you're, you're bringing that kitchen table to guys like me who miss it, you know, who yearn for it. And, and you, on the other hand, you, you took it in a slightly different direction and, and you're doing great things, man. You, 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 you're getting the narrative from, from the fire side, the police side and, and, and whoever else that you interview. 
I mean, it, it, you're doing well, and, and it, it's it's a needed venue, and it's uh, it's it's great. You're doing really good, and I'm I'm, I'm glad to know you now. We're friends, and uh, it's been Likewise. a great experience. Oh, my, the pleasure's all mine. So, so thank you. Like I said, stick around. Thanks to everybody that tuned in tonight. We're going to see each other soon anyway, because we'll be in the Getting Salty chat in about 20 minutes. So we'll all see each other. Um, coming up next on the Mike to New Haven podcast, I know tomorrow Mike Vaccaro, who's a longtime writer for the New York Post, he'll be here. So that'll be the first show of what I think will be a doubleheader. That's 1230. As far as a guest for seven o'clock, I don't have one yet. I'll try to find one. And Friday, I'm going to work to lock it in with him. Uh, he does a lot of dignitary protection and retirement, but he had an interesting career, retired as a sergeant with the NYPD. Mark Mulitz will be here. So a couple of interesting shows on tap. I'll try to see if I can get a guest for tomorrow's 7 o'clock show. So we'll see what happens with that. In the meantime, on behalf of Ron Caraba, this has been Volume 27 of the Best of the Bravest Interviews with the FDNY's Elite. For the Getting Salty fans, I'll see you shortly. For everybody else, we will see you next time. Have a great rest of your night. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.